time since I reviewed the French take on the Cast of Thousands World War II film with Is Paris Burning? This time I take a look at one of the U.S. installments of the genre, one I even brought up in that video, with the adaptation of Cornelius Ryan's book, The Longest Day. The film tells the story of Operation Overlord, the Allied invasion of Normandy on D-Day. The narrative focuses on a handful of general perspective from the various nations whose troop took, troops took part. The film's cast includes some of the biggest shining stars of old Hollywood, at least those who were still active in 1960 when the film started production. From the U.S. side, we see the airborne troops who landed behind enemy lines, focusing on the 82nd Airborne, with a particular focus on one of the battalion commanders, Lieutenant Colonel Vandervoort, played by John Wayne. Richard Bamer also has a supporting role as a private in the 82nd Airborne, and Red Buttons has a short but very significant role as Private John Steele, who was part of the disastrous drop on St. Mariglis. For the Omaha Beach landings, the narrative focus is on Brigadier General Coda, played by Robert Mitchum, with supporting performances by the original Christopher Pike, Jeffrey Hunter, and also a role by Eddie Albert. For the Utah Beach language landing, which they don't spend so much time on, we have Henry Fonda as General Theodore Roosevelt Jr., the son of Teddy Roosevelt, and a cousin of the president. The assault by the 2nd Ranger Battalion on Point Duhok's guns featured pop star of the time Paul Anka, who also contributed to the film's score, and is probably one of the only film's major U.S. stars to fire a gun in the whole movie. The film also gives plenty of attention to the British and Free French troops, although less of the actors who play them would stand out quite as much to modern audiences. Probably the biggest actor of, at the time of note is Richard Burton, future King Arthur, as a RAF pilot whose scenes bookend the movie, and who probably appears in the film's most cynical scene, or at least the only really cynical scene. The other British actor of note to modern audiences is Sean Connery, who shot this before filming started in Dr. No and who played, of all things, a comic relief character on the Sword Beach landings. Aside from the Sword Beach landings, the other real focus of British troops in the film is the capture of Pegasus Bridge by British airborne troops, which is probably the biggest action scene the British have in the film. And also, setting up something that comes up in a bridge too far, the film gives some real narrative focus to the uh, non-Anglophone allies, in this case the French resistance and the Free French troops. On the resistance side of things, we see their preparatory operations, demolishing telegraph and phone lines, and blasting railroad lines to hinder Nazi communications and movement. With the Free French troops, we see their assault on the port city of Wistrom. I bring all this up because this film, as a film and a depiction of D-Day, does not exist in a vacuum, and I have to address the elephant in the room. Saving Private Ryan. On the one hand, The Longest Day feels more sterile than Saving Private Ryan. Yeah, characters die, things blow up, bullets are fired, but Saving Private Ryan is more visceral. Literal. In Saving Private Ryan, blood splatters on the camera, limbs are lost, people are blown in half, and they beg for their mother or their loved ones as they die. And, well, from a raw technical standpoint, The Longest Day is far too soon for that sort of thing. First off, it is important to mention that The Longest Day was deliberately shot in black and white, specifically to draw comparisons for audiences with newsreel footage. Second Private Ryan was sought, shot using a blue filter to give the film a colder, harsher color palette while still allowing color, which allowed scenes with particularly graphic violence to stand out. Second, when The Longest Day came out, while the Hayes Code was no longer in effect, the floodgates of gore and splatter films that were the hallmarks of the exploitation genre had yet to come into full effect. Herschel Gordon Lewis's Blood Feast would come out the year after The Longest Day, and considering his production style, that film was probably filmed the same year, and certainly, considering how it was distributed, would not have gotten any level of cultural penetration that would have inspired filmmakers to say, hey, yeah, let's actually go for the gore. However, probably the biggest innovations in violence, and in particular gore prosthetic effects, which 
what is the thing that lets you have people be blown in half that it has limb amputation that you do the amputations to the visceral degree that saving private ryan did that those innovations came out of italy in particular the horror and giallo films from directors like lucio fulci and fulci didn't start seriously getting into gore effects until the late 1970s early 80s and one of the films that really jump-started gore effects Dawn of the Dead, which was released in Italy as a zombie, was not released until 1978. Earlier films certainly had blood, but the technique behind it was never quite at the level that we get in Saving Private Ryan, and certainly at this time, when The Longest Day came out, would not have allowed the level of intensity of the violence that we expect, or that we that we get from Saving Private Ryan, and what makes the, that film's depiction of the Omaha Beach landings so incredibly striking. Now, from a historical accuracy side of things, there is a lot to cover here, which is why I asked the historic nerd, one of my fellow hosts from the console explosion, to help cover this topic. When looking at films about D-Day, a few titles come to mind. Saving Private Ryan is one of the more recent titles that recounts the event in graphic detail. Another is Band of Brothers, a series on HBO which recounts the D-Day invasion from the respective U.S. paratroopers. However, both those films and series don't capture D-Day in the same scope that a 1962 film, The Longest Day, does. What The Longest Day does is that it links the perspective of countless individuals who took part in or greatly influenced the events of D-Day. And given that The Longest Day was made in the 1960s, a time when Hollywood greatly embellished things, not to say we don't do that now, but it's also a lot easier to fact check now, but let's see how historically accurate The Longest Day actually is. What a lot of films don't do now is show what a mess the Nazi command structure was. Films and even documentaries just bother to state that Erwin Rommel was in charge of the D-Day defense lines for the Nazi forces. And Rommel was a fearsome opponent to the Allies. He served masterfully in North Africa, defending against the Allied invasion from Egypt, as well as that of the invasions of Morocco, where the American forces forces pushed inland, and greatly outnumbered and with a massive lack of resources, he managed to hold the Americans and Allied forces for quite some time before being pushed out of North Africa back across the Mediterranean into Italy. So he had a lot of respect, but what a lot of documentaries and films don't talk about, they just mention his name because Rommel the Desert Fox was a very fearsome individual, they don't talk about how he wasn't in, actually in direct command of Normandy. Every decision he made had to go through someone higher up than him. So, when the Allied forces landed and the fearsome German panzers lay in wait, the order he had sent out to immediately repel any Allied force back into the ocean was ignored and they never left camp. The Longest Day covers this quite well in a scene where a Nazi coastal commander is requesting pa the panzers for a counterattack. And that order is ignored because the Fuhrer himself had stated that those panzers would only move under his orders. And also, Hitler decided to take a sleeping pill, so he requested that no one wake him for any reason, and his general staff decided to do just that. And waited. The film gets this very correct. Many films don't quite get into the fact that the German high command was becoming a nightmare and the oversight for personal initiative was being squashed. And instead, a lot of films just portray the Nazis as this very strong and powerful enemy. Yes, they were, not to undermine the fact that Germany was a very powerful country, but their command structure was a mess. And a lot of this came from the longer the war went, the more pressure there was between the SS and the Wehrmacht. And what you gotta realize is that the SS was a militarized wing of the Nazi party, and was integrated into that. And then the Wehrmacht was actually the army of the nation of Germany. So you had a bit of conflict going on there where the sense that Hitler didn't really trust his generals. So you had this kind of roundabout way for them to command these things. So Germany had a very messed up command structure which only benefited the allies in the long run. <laughs> so the longest day covers a lot of what happened and the only major thing it skips, really, is the contribution of the Canadians during the D-Day landings. But when looking at the film and what it got wrong, there isn't really too much to pick at, aside from mostly uniform errors, which Hollywood has never really gotten right. And 
that's kind of the intriguing thing about it. What The Longest Day did very right was that they brought in people who actually took part in the operations that they filmed. And they brought those people in to help oversee the film and the overall production of these projects. They even had people who fought at Pegasus Bridge come in and make sure the scene was more accurate. And they also filmed on location. And they even filmed at Point du Nuc. Forgive me, my French is really bad. This is a position kind of on the Normandy beachhead that was about 150 feet above sea level. But this also brings me to the mystery of the guns at Point du Nuc. See, when the Allied forces attacked, they captured the position, and when they actually took the, took the high ground, they discovered that these guns were nothing more than a pile of telegraph poles. So while doing research, I couldn't find a concrete answer as to why the German support guns weren't at that location. And if you know anything, please let me know in the comments below. But my personal theory would be that the guns were supposed to be there, because ultimately Point Do Not was a position 150 feet above, the, above sea level, and ultimately gave them a significant commanding view above the beaches in that area. And to attack it would be a massive drain on any attacker's resources. So to attempt to capture it, you'd have to if you wanted to have a successful beachhead, especially if you thought there were artillery pieces on that, on that ground that could bombard your beachhead. So I couldn't think of anything better to do than to fake out your opponent and force him to waste manpower on a very unfavorable assault. So what is really intriguing is a lot of people don't consider when looking at historical events, especially from the German perspective during World War II, is that the German military archives ultimately, at the end of the Second World War, were completely destroyed. So information dating back to the Prussian War of 1871 had been effectively lost to history because those archives were burned and destroyed. So we don't necessarily know what their thinking was. But if you know this answer, please let me know. But this also brings me to how the assault went down in the film on Point du Dunoc. And that has to do with how they attacked the cliffs. And this comes from the Americans modified mortar tubes to fire grappling hooks. What the film doesn't show you is that the ropes attached to the grappling hooks had been soaked in seawater, causing a massive number of the hooks to fall short because of the added weight. So only about 19 of the 60 hooks fired actually worked. And the film may not have shown you this because they kind of probably didn't want you to see or I don't think audiences would have believed the amount of technical failure that happened or that you would believe that the Americans somehow pulled off the assault after that. But after that, there really only are a few cosmetic things that The Longest Day changed. Notably, some soldiers didn't wear their helmets, but that has to do with the fact that if they're wearing a helmet, their face is awfully hard to see in a film. So that can be why they decided to make that creative choice. But another thing would be that during D-Day, U.S. paratroopers launched thousands of fake paratroopers behind the lines loaded with explosives. In the film, they're portrayed as these very, very accurate-to-life kind of little dummies. Where in reality, a lot of the ones the Americans dropped were just rubber-stuffed dummies that didn't look anything like a person. I mean, there, there were other accounts of kind of very small ones in comparison that looked kind of like paratroopers that the Americans dropped. But ultimately, they kind of changed it to look a little more believable, because I'm not sure anyone kind of at the time would have bought it. But that's really what the American forces and British forces did, was they dropped these tiny paratroopers, which sent a lot of German forces in the wrong direction to go and attack these soldiers. But one of the things that kind of really bothers me, and I'm not necessarily sure if this is accurate or not, but in doing my research, I couldn't find anything that quite affirmatively answered it yes or no. And that would be the clicker scene, where a U.S. paratrooper clicks once for yes, or basically a response, hello, and then the other paratroopers would respond twice with an affirmative saying, yes, we're American. And these clickers were handed out to the paratroopers the night of the invasion because they were going to be running around all over in the dark, and they wanted a way to verify that they were, in fact, friendly. And the film kind of goes into this a little bit and gives you kind of a good scene with... Uh, <laughs> with the Duke, kind of showing you what's going on. But the scene I'm talking about is where a U.S. paratrooper clicks once, and then he gets two rapid clicks back, and then another two rapid clicks back. And then as soon as he pops out, he's shot twice by a German soldier, who then reams his bolt back, and the sound in the film is awfully similar. But I have 
a replica German car 98. However, mine's a Yugoslavia, Yugoslavian copy. But let's hear how this sounds in comparison, which I, even if it's loaded, it doesn't sound anything like a clicker. Nothing. So, and what's even odd is that in the film, the German soldier clicks his weapon back four times, and somehow he manages to fire another round, or two rounds in quick succession. These rifles only have an internal magazine of about five rounds, so unless there was another German soldier with him, that wouldn't have necessarily been possible. But that's just one of the scenes that, ultimately, I think that the creators of the film did it. So that there would be kind of this narrative tension going on in the film for later events. For example, when the young, young American paratrooper, I think the audience is attached to at this point, clicks behind a brick wall and then he's listening and he hears two clicks back, I think it's meant to build kind of suspense for, is he going to get shot? What's going to happen? And I think that's why they did that in the film. But ultimately, I can't find any accounts of German, German bolt-action rifles sounding anything like the clicker. But aside from that, I can't find anything that is grossly inaccurate to the events of World War II. The only other thing I found was that the film portrays Omaha Beach in a little bit different of a light. For example, when the troops land, pretty much immediately in reality, most of the lieutenants and NCOs were killed by German machine gun fire. And that was because on Omaha Beach, American bombardment from the ocean, or Allied bombardment from the ocean, was actually grossly ineffective and they'd missed most of the defensive positions on Omaha Beach. And that even included a gigantic aerial bombardment as well, which, by all counts, overshot the mark and bombed about a mile and a half inland behind the defense line. So when American forces finally did land, Omaha Beach was the most heavily defended of all the positions because it wasn't grossly impacted by the shock and awe from the ocean. So American forces were just getting torn up to an unbelievable extent. And something else that they don't really cover in the film is that when American forces landed in Omaha Beach, the troops hit first, but there were supposed to be 29 DD amphibious Sherman tanks to follow up with them. But because Normandy happened at a time when it was in a break between a kind of a storm, so that's why Allied forces went for it, because they didn't think the Germans would, the Germans were grossly unprepared because they didn't believe anyone would attack in that weather. So the Allies did it. Only, the D.D. Sherman amphibious tanks were only designed to operate in one-foot waves, so relatively calm, nice days. So when they finally did launch the D.D. Shermans, 27 immediately sank due to the high waves of the ocean of that day, because when they launched, they were about 2,000 yards off the beach. And of the two or so that made it to the shorehead, or the beachhead, they were immediately destroyed by German anti-tank fire. So. Omaha Beach was a nightmare to be in because Allied armor was immediately negated by the German defenses. But what ultimately turned this around for the American forces was a general by the name of Coda, well, last name Coda, who organized and screamed his way up the beach, standing and taking massive risks, but inspiring his men greatly and pulling them off the beach. In the film, this is depicted rather interestingly because General Coda actually lived to the 1970, 1971, so he was able to see the film on the screen and kind of revisit or recount his, the events he did himself. And in the film, it's portrayed that the American forces were stuck behind a large concrete seawall, where in reality, that concrete seawall wasn't there. It was just a large series of German barriers that were reinforced with barbed wire and other things. And so the United States forces used Bangalore torpedoes, which is a, a large cylindrical piece of metal filled with dynamite, and they blew their way through. And essentially, because Omaha Beach comes into a series of draws, which the terrain naturally forces men into choke points, which gave the Germans a pretty good advantage. So he actually, once they blew the hole, he inspired his men by saying, if we're going to die on the beach, let's die inland, or something along those lines. And he, he led the charge himself and led his men off the beach to capture the higher points on Normandy. Or sorry, the higher points on Omaha Beach, and ultimately turning the tide of the conflict. What's intriguing is that the German defenses at D-Day 
ultimately depended entirely on keeping the Americans and Allied forces on the beaches. And that just wasn't something that was possible against the massive number of forces the Americans were throwing at them. And what The Longest Day actually doesn't really go into, but some other films did, is that a lot of the troops that fought on D-Day for the German side were conscripts from conquered territories, like Czechoslovakia or Austria. So they weren't necessarily motivated to fight for the German war machine. So a lot of these guys were trying to surrender. And Saving Private Ryan shows a scene where a guy's trying to surrender, he's trying to say he's now German, he's Czech, and he's shot. And that's kind of a subtle historical nod at what was going on. That a lot of these men were broken, they didn't want to fight anymore, because they had been fighting since 1939 and they were ultimately tired. But once Normandy succeeded, Germany now faced one of the most advanced logistical networks of supplies in the world. And the United States had an inexhaustible network of resources to exploit to throw against them. And that's also what's really intriguing. But The Longest Day is actually relatively accurate in the sense that it gets a lot of the major points and only changes a few things because it was kind of what they needed to do to make it believable on film. But ultimately, they hit most of the marks and covered everything that was relatively accurate. So, yeah. That's the longest day in a nutshell. But, um, what, something the film doesn't cover is that a lot of the German officers were off at the war games, but what's kind of really interesting is that a couple of the generals were out seeing their mistresses in Paris, and they didn't really, I guess they didn't want to say that in the film, but these guys were away from their command post because they were out seeing women. And what's really interesting is Rommel was actually out, <laughs> he was going to his wife's 50th birthday, and he was driving. And because the Allies controlled the air, there was no way he was going to fly because he didn't want to get shot down. So he took the long drive and had no idea about the events unfolding around him until it was ultimately too late to repulse the Allied invasion. So, so The Longest Day gets a lot of stuff accurate. But, yeah, hope you enjoyed it. So, The Longest Day is a film that, while it doesn't have the same degree of violent punch that you might expect after seeing Saving Private Ryan is a very good telling of the story of the D-Day landings, both in terms of cinema and in terms of historical narrative. Now later, I'm going to finish off the Cornelius Ryan duology with the other film adaptation of one of his books, with A Bridge Too Far. But next week, we have the best of the rest for the Nintendo Power Retrospectives for the magazine's fifth year. We'll see you then. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.